Okay, apes and humans. So this is uh, kind of an addendum to our human origins lecture. As we briefly talked about in class, we, there was this pretty large project of scientists going into the field and studying apes, uh, all the great apes, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, but also bonobo chimpanzees and both lowland and mountain gorillas. Um, but I want to talk about the, the main three that, that, that we know about, and, and because they were sent there specifically for human origin purposes. And it ties a lot in with what we've already talked about in the class. So let me do a little bit of repetition um, from, from the other day, just to kind of make sure we got the context right, because so much of what we're doing in history including environmental history, really is getting to that thing of just, well, who are we? Why are we here? What's, what's, the, what's our purpose? What's, why are we the way we are? And of course, some of that you can't answer with history. Some of that's philosophy or religion, but, but a lot of that we can answer with history, at least how we got here and, and why we are the way we are. A lot of that we can look at history. And of course, as, as, as kind of the basis of the class, a lot of that history, of course, is natural history and, and the relationship between humans and the natural world. And I think where we come from is, even though it's an uncomfortable topic, and I did want to, I forgot to say this yesterday, and I know, I, I, I don't know who, but I can guarantee there is at least one person, if not 10 people, and I have nobody in mind when I say that, by the way, that, that are, that's probably uncomfortable with this topic. Uh, a lot of people are. And we're in the South, which is, uh, this is not a topic that's real popular in the South, especially in schools and such. So I, I do wanna make sure I do acknowledge that. I don't expect anybody to change their personal beliefs because of this class. Uh, you don't have to agree with me. I mean, the only thing I always tell students, you, you just have to give me on the exam what you, what you have to give me, but you never have to change your mind. And, and again, this is just one topic of many. So if this is an uncomfortable topic for you, don't feel like the rest of the class is gonna be uncomfortable for you necessarily. Anyway. But this, where we come from, it's, it's a huge topic. And yet, we've only fairly recently begun to really explore this topic. We, of course, don't come from chimpanzees or gorillas or orangutans, and we definitely don't come from monkeys. But we do all share, at least the apes, all share an ancestor going far enough back that would have been an ape. And I, I still consider humans apes, even though that I don't normally say that, but if, I'm, if you push me, I'll be like, yeah, we're still apes. We're just really advanced apes. And as we talked about the other day, there was a time when apes were the dominant species, especially in the old world, Africa, Europe, Asia. Uh, 10 to 15 million years ago, there were at least 25 separate ape species active in the world at that point. Now there's three. Um, and so where we come from, would be an ape and, and, and learning about ape behavior might give us insight into early human behavior. I mean, maybe, again, it's, it's not a guarantee, but that's kind of an idea. And as we talked about the other day, Darwin was the first one to suggest that Africa might be where we're from originally, because that's where, as far as he knew, that's where all the apes were. Now we know there's orangutans in Indonesia uh, but he only knew about chimps and gorillas, and he knew they were in Africa. So he said, Africa is where you need to look. People thought he was nuts. Raymond Dart picked up the challenge, and he you know, he was an amateur. He was a doctor, not an anthropologist. But he did find uh, a, basically a chimp skull of a chimp that stood upright. That became known as Australopithecine, which translates to Southern Ape, because it was Southern Africa. And we know that later, not Dart, but later, folks discovered that they did indeed use very primitive tools, scrapers and you know, rocks to pound with and maybe cut with. And again, that was seen as, well, this is clearly, they're clearly human ancestors because the belief at that time was that humans, we were the tool maker. In fact, there was a couple, there was one book called Man the Tool Maker. And that, that, was, that was the thing that made us human. Now, you and I both know there's plenty of animals that use tools, and they knew it back then. They knew about bird nests and, and, and ant beds and things like that, but they thought, well, that's all instinct. They don't learn it. They don't teach it. it it's, they don't really make many things. They don't get creative with it. It's just, it's like breathing for them. It's just rote. These seem to be a slight bit different, and people say, well, obviously, those are our ancestors. They're tool makers, right? The person we didn't get to talk about the other day but he's important to today is a guy named Louis Leakey. 
Louis Leakey was the person that kind of picked up Raymond's dart, Africa focus. And again, by the 1950s, there were still very few people in Africa looking for human origins. People, at that point, people still dismissed Raymond Dart. Um, as I said the other day, it was uh, Donald Johansson that kind of revived Dart's findings by continuing to find astrolopithecines. But Louis Leakey, who was British, he, he grew up in British Kenya, which later became an independent country. And so being right there, he began to look for human uh, remains, and, you know, human origin remains. And he found quite a number. Louis Leakey is a fascinating character. He's kind of controversial. He was, you know, he was a good anthropologist, but he was also a showman. He knew how to work the media. The, you know, he was maybe a bit of a sexist at times. Um, you know, he's, he's a bit controversial today. Um, and there's a lot of debate over just how good of an anthropologist he actually was. But a lot of what he was doing to defend them a little bit was sort of necessary because he was in a field that wasn't very popular at this point. And in a place, Africa, where no one else was really looking, he kind of needed to do that to, to gen up uh, funding and to get people listening. And, and again, where he uh, did most of his work actually was in uh, Tanzania, uh, Olduvai Gorge. And again, Gorge literally an opening in the earth. This was a, still to this day, one of the richest places to find fossils from early human ancestors. So this is where he did most of his work. One of his big discoveries though, what, and we haven't talked about this yet, we'll talk about it on Tuesday, but was something that he called Homo habilis, which translates to handyman. It's basically another chump, maybe a little bit bigger, a little more advanced than astrolopithecine. Some people say it's still just astrolopithecine, but it, but it was basically this upright ape that clearly used tools, which is why he called them handyman. Because again, that focus on humans using tools as being uh, the real marker of, of, of humanness. Now his secret weapon was his wife, Mary Leakey. We talked about the footprints that she found the other day. She was really uh, the powerhouse here. She was the, the solid scientist between the two of them. She was, in fact, some of the discoveries that he, I mean, they worked together, they were partners, but a lot of the discoveries that he's credited with, she's really doing. And, but of course, we're talking 50s, early 60s, when women were not prominent in science, they weren't given the credit they should have been given. We saw that with Rachel Carson. Um, it's it's kind of sad, but on the other hand, uh, it's also the time. Uh, Mary Leakey would continue to work all the way up until her death in the 1990s. I mean, she lives 24 years after Louis Leakey. In fact, some of her best work was done in the 70s and 80s, but she's a part of this story as well. All right, so Louis Leakey was really, by the early late 50s, early 60s, Louis Leakey and his wife Mary were the leading scientists in human origins research. And again, he already knew, obviously we come from apes, um, all the evidence points towards that. And, you know, we know that apes used to be the dominant species. If we want to understand how Australopithecines or Homo habilis or later ones like that we haven't talked about yet, Homo erectus or Neanderthals, maybe even early Homo sapiens, how they behave, how they adapted to their environment, we might learn a bit of that because we don't have a, records of that behavior for the most part, maybe by studying apes we can learn some of that early behavior. That was a Louis Leakey idea. And then he, you know, for years he thought about this, I need somebody to do this. And eventually three women were hired by him at different times uh, to do this. Uh, and they're often nicknamed the trimates, as in primates, of course. And uh, they all got, it, Louis Leakey managed to get them funding through the National Geographic. And I know they're still around today. They have a channel and they still have the magazine. I don't think they're, what they used to be. It's hard to explain, I think, to people under the age of 40, um, how big of a deal the National Geographic used to be. When they did an article on something, I mean, like, like if you were a scientist and like these three women, you were on the cover, that was it. You were guaranteed funding for the rest of your life. And, and, and if they did a TV special about you, and all three of these women get TV specials in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, again, I mean, that was instant celebrity. This is a huge deal. So he gets some funding, and then eventually they are able to make the success of it. So again, Louis Leakey is the one that's kicking this off. And sorry, it's kind of a blurry image. Yeesh. Um, but on the top right, that's Jane Goodall. And then on the bottom left, that's Diane Fossey. And then on the bottom right, that's Baruti Galdikas. I'm going to talk about all three of these briefly. 
And we are, I do have some videos online that of, of all three of these people working and some of their findings. Keep in mind, now, this project starts with Jane Goodall in 1960, and her major discoveries come about around 64, 65. That's really when the public begins to learn about Jane Goodall. By the time Jane Goodall is doing her work, this is the time of Silent Spring. This is the beginning of environmental awareness, and people are beginning to think about animals and the natural world and our connection with it. And then, of course, by 1970, when Baruti Galdikas begins her work in 1971, this is post-Earth Day. So again, the environmental movement is fully on. And if you look around at American culture in the 70s, everybody gets fascinated by animals. National Geographic, their specials are, you know, top the ratings whenever they do shows. People were reading about animals. They were into sharks and whales and manatees and sea turtles and everyone to save animals. And we're gonna talk about that period more later, get into things like the Endangered Species Act. So for Lewis Leakey and these three women, it's, it's perfect timing. Everybody wants to fund this. Everybody's interested in it. They all write books that become bestsellers. You know, if they did this 20 years earlier, or maybe even 20 years later, like now, I don't think most people are talking about this much anymore. It was just this magical period where people were very interested in this topic. So Jane Goodall, first off, she's the, without a doubt the most famous of these, the longest working of these uh, women and uh, probably the most important findings, at least as far as human origins are concerned. So Jane Goodall uh, was from London, England. She was always fascinated by animals. She, uh, she did train, I mean, she did go to college, so she did have some training in animal behavior, but for the most part, she was just, she ended up working as a secretary. She went to Africa, she saved up her money, went to Africa on safari. She knew about Louis Leakey. She had heard that he was looking for people to do, you know, this project. And she made a point of kind of meeting him and said, I, you know, in Kenya and said, I, I'd really like to do this. And, and they talked and he kind of became, uh, you know, impressed with her. And so in 19... First off, 1959, he hires her to be his secretary, so she's there, and then he slowly begins to get her training, he sends her to London to work with primatologists and animal behaviorists, and in 1960, he gets funding, it's not much, but he gets funding through the National Geographic Society to sponsor research at the Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania, which has a large population of chimpanzees. And basically what she does is just watch chimpanzees. Every day goes out and watches and takes notes. Eventually more people, first off, it's just Jane Goodall. You know, she has a little crew that are helping her. Eventually she has other scientists and, and, and this project still goes on to this day. It's just not her anymore. But every day she would just watch them, take notes. You know, they went here, they went here, they did this. They, they, they touched each other, they beat each other, blah, 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 blah you know. What's really weird, in 1960, hardly anybody was doing that. If you studied animals and animal behavior, you, you captured them and you, you, you drugged them so you could knock them out. You took them to a laboratory or to a zoo and you did it there under kind of, under kind of artificial conditions. You didn't do it in the wild. Now, I will say she did one thing that was a bit controversial at the time. She did feed them to get them to come closer to her. So she would have feeding stations. Nowadays, they probably don't, wouldn't do that. That would be considered a little too interventionist. So that's the one thing she did do. But she just watched them. And people, you know, people just didn't do that at the time. Um, and Louis Leakey always wanted women to do this. He thought women were more observant, more detailed oriented. I mean, he was married to Mary Leakey. I think that helped <laughs> implant that idea. He also thought they would be less of a threat to apes. So apes might accept them better. And there does seem to be a lot of truth to that. We do, even to this day, um, with a lot of animal projects, there does seem to be an element of that that might play out, you know, but and we do see a lot of women in animal behavior with a lot of success. So maybe, maybe Leakey was right. Um, maybe not. Maybe that's just a sexist viewpoint. Who knows? But, but there does seem to be some truth to it. He also wanted people that were amateurs initially. I mean, he wanted them to get training, but he didn't want scientists coming in with preconceived notions. Keep in mind, this is a period where, again, most people weren't looking at animals and, and animal behavior and animal emotions. I mean, that was a wacky idea at the time. And if you looked at the media, um, you know, if you looked at movies or TV shows or comic books or novels, I mean, apes were always the mean ones. They were ones grabbing women at, at King Kong and taking them away, or, you know, or they were not smart, they were vicious. 
And uh, so this was, again, very radical research to go and just watch animals. And of course, watching apes was even more radical. She also, again, she, she did stuff that people didn't like at the time, mostly male scientists. She named the animals, names like Flo and David Graybeard and, 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 and Mike um, Goliath. Instead of saying ape, eight or ape two H X Z, you know, these actual personal human names. In her notes, she would write things like they were happy, they were frightened, they cooperated. And people thought you're you're imposing human behavior onto apes. But then anybody who, nowadays who keeps pets knows that of course your dog and cat can be happy, they can be sad. And she actually observed a lot of behavior that we used to consider very human cooperation, um, altruism, which altruism means to be nice to each other, just, just to be nice to each other. Um, she discovered, I mean, she, about 400 different behaviors that, that we consider kind of human-like, laughing, joy, frightened, anger, murder, aggression, all these things. So that was quite remarkable. But really her two big discoveries, and these relate directly to human origins, First off, tool use. She was the first one to observe chimps using tools. Now this photo, by the way, is from a zoo. This is not one of her photos, but she found chimps going to termite mounds, taking sticks, altering the stick, placing it in the mound, and then eating the termites. They, 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 they saw a need, they went to a tree, they picked a stick out, they altered it, they made a tool, and then they used it. Now, initially people thought, well, this is just uh, instinct. It's not, it turns out not all chimps do this and they have to learn it. And they also, she also discovered them using stone tools as choppers and pounders and scrapers, very primitive, but she did see them. But what she also witnessed is that they teach their young to do this. The mothers, because only the mothers are the parents active parents, they teach their young to do this. Some chimps don't teach their young, some do. Some teach them how to do this tool, others teach them how to do that set of tools. So it's very primitive, but it is there. So when we talk about ourselves, use like a lot of you said that being human is using technology. It is human, but it's not uniquely human. We do it better than anybody else. We're more complex with it, but we do the same thing. You know, I mean, we're doing it right now. Um, you guys are in college, you know, you're learning job skills, you know, I mean, you, you know, a third of your life is learning how to do things, right? Um, they may do it in a couple of days, we might spend 22 years doing it, but nonetheless, we're still doing the same basic process that chimps do. So tool use turns out is not uniquely human, maybe the, the level we do it, but, but it, we do see this in chimps. And we do see it in a few other animals, but the, but the, the tool making and the teaching of tools, we don't see in many other animals. This was, I mean, this is what made Jane Goodall Jane Goodall. This was it. Um, she was already getting her PhD from Cambridge and this became a major part of her PhD. And she does get her PhD uh, uh, in 1965, she becomes Dr. Goodall. Again, noticing the, these emotions, the complexities of these relationships between chunks was, was part of this as well. Now keep in mind, this is the 60s. So not only is it the post silver, uh, silver spring, this post silent spring era, but it's also the time of the Vietnam War. And there's a lot of debate over war. There's a debate over racial segregation and civil rights. This is the Cold War and there's a lot of nuclear fears. And, and in fact, many people really thought that humans were gonna end everything before it's over with. There's a lot of pessimism about human nature and, and what is humans. And, and when Jane Goodall started looking at, at chumps, her and many readers of National Geographic and other scientists felt hope because they thought, oh, these are chimps cooperating. They're nice to each other. And, and, and maybe, maybe we humans aren't doomed to violence. Maybe we can learn not to be violent. Then in the night, and by the way, there are some videos of, 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 of as you'll see, there are some videos I have uploaded of chimps doing the tool use and stuff, very short little videos. And I also have a video of the next thing. Because in the 70s, she discovered what's usually referred to as the Gombe War. Uh, the population of chips, uh, chumps split into two populations, and one population literally began to attack 
and kill the other population. And a lot of their tactics are very militaristic. They, they do surprise attacks. They, they even marched in a, a bit of a formation at times. It, it, I mean, it was still chump, not human, but it was very ominous. And, and it is a war. In fact, it's considered the Gandhi chump war, as they call it. Um, and this, in fact, it apparently sent Jane Goodall into a major depression because it, it completely ruined this image that chumps are um, completely altruistic and wonderful. It turns out they're very human-like, that some are nice, some are not nice, and uh, they're all capable of extreme violence if pushed far enough. Very human-like in that way. And it's also depressing because it means that the violent nature of humans may go all the way back to our, our ape ancestors, perhaps. Jane Goodall would end up doing this research for about 30 years. There are several documentaries about her. Uh, she's written several books over the years. Around the early 1990s, she ended up kind of retiring from active uh, research. By this point, it was a large organization. Um, she was training young scientists out there. And she started doing more conservation work. And this is a trend with all three of these women is because all these populations are very threatened. And so she became very much kind of an environmentalist and a conservationist. And nowadays she's very involved in, in issues like you know, conservation of food and stuff. Some of her later research, I don't think it's, it's some of her later activism, some of it's not quite as sciencey as I would personally like. Some of her stuff does seem to be a little bit, um, maybe a little, little, little bit outside of science. I know she's kind of got, she's a little funny about vaccination stuff, but her work on chimps is phenomenal. And I'm a huge fan of Jane Goodall and she's one of my favorite people. She did write, I know you can barely see it, it's not on the screen, but she did write one major work on chimpanzees in 1986. This is her magnum opus, The Chimpanzees of Dombey. And this really is, I mean, it's, a, it's not a fun read, but it's a very serious work about chimp behavior. And this is really what, this is her main contribution to science in a published form. But she's published plenty of books, as you can see. And I have several of these uh, in The Shadow of Man. These are all bestsellers, Visions of Caliban. Uh, through a window, I actually got that one signed. I actually got to meet her. I was so shy and, and, and intimidated. I, I didn't say a word, I just <laughs> signed this. Uh, anyway, really cool person. And there's a lot more out there about her, um, but, but it's been almost 30 years and she's done active research. Again, she's more of a conservationist now. The other thing that I think she's really well known for is being an inspiration to a lot of scientists, especially women scientists. And in particular, the other two of the trimates, Jane Goodall was first and that led to others to join the join the group. And what I'm gonna talk about now is Diane Fossey, who on the screen is the one on the left with the dark hair. So Diane Fossey is American. She's originally from San Francisco. She trained as an occupational therapist. She worked with children, uh, uh, physically disadvantaged children in Kentucky. She knew, she, had, she went to Africa, she saved up her money, she went, she loved it. She was fascinated by Jane Goodall's work. She knew about Louis Leakey, what he, that he wanted more women to do this. And Louis Leakey happened to come to Kentucky and she made sure, you know, for, for a, a talk and she met him. And then she went and met him in Africa and she slowly convinced him that she would be the right person to study gorillas. And he agreed and he hired her. And uh, he, he actually thought her ther therapy background might be quite useful. He sent her to Gombe to work with Jane Goodall for a little while. And by 1960, cover up my notes. By 1966, I do have to cheat on this one on, on years. I think it's 66, Oosh, I hate when I get dates wrong. And I do all the time. Yeah, 19, December 1966 is when she showed up for, to Jane Goodall. And by 1967, she was in what used to be called Belgian Congo, um, but later was split up into several countries. She was on the Rwanda side. If you know anything about Africa history, you know Rwanda has been a very much a, um, a volatile place. And this is something that you'll see Jane Goodall uh, much more photogenic. The, the media loved her. She was much more reserved. She, you know, she was very media savvy. But also, where she worked was much more. I mean, she had snakes. She had, you know, there was some terrorism. I mean, there, it was rough, but it was kind of easy, relatively speaking. Rwanda, a very violent place in the 70s and 80s, and sadly still today at times. It was a very thick rainforest. I mean, literally every day she would have to cut her way. I mean, the trails, she cut a trail and they would grow over it within a day. Much rougher area. And she, she was a lot more shyer, reserved. She was a little bit older than Jane Goodall. Um, and she was already older when she started as well. Um, she didn't play the media as well. She didn't, you know, photographers didn't like her as much, you know, um, 
So she had a harder time with the media and she always, she loved Jane Goodall, but there, there was a lot of reason that middle about how easy Goodall seemed to have it and how much everybody liked Goodall. Um, but she absolutely fell in love with the mountain gorillas, which there's lowland gorillas. Uh, they're more plentiful. These are more rare. They've only been fairly recently discovered. They weren't known that I think it's still less than a hundred years that people have even known they existed, uh, but they're mountain gorillas and they're quite rare. They're very rare today. Uh, she had a hard time getting close to them initially, you know, but eventually she learned that if she imitated them, their voice, their behavior, they would start to gravitate towards her. A lot of people were very critical that she does interact with them a lot. A lot of the photos are her laying on them and hugging them. And there's still even today debate about how much she was involved with them. Is that, is that science? And that also gets into the male, female, females are too I mean, I don't believe this myself, but a lot of people say females are too, too emotional and she's she's not a professional, although she also gets her PhD from Cambridge eventually, um, and too emotional that she also used names to describe them as. However, the biggest thing she discovered, I think she was a great scientist, but the biggest thing she discovered is that they did not fit the image. Mountain gorillas were only vicious if attacked. If you went to take one of their babies, they would fight all the way until the death. So if you go to a zoo, and you see a gorilla that is a wild gorilla captured in the wild. When you look at that gorilla, you're looking at a whole family of gorillas that have been killed to bring that gorilla to the zoo. Uh, they really changed how people looked at gorillas and even zoo gorillas. But again, movies like King Kong and other Hollywood productions of, of man eaters and, 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 and you know, vicious animals, turns out they're not. Uh, I mean, they can be dangerous, but they're actually quite gentle. They're vegetarians. They don't, they don't eat any meat. They only eat leaves and trees, small trees and such. They live entirely on the ground. Um, so quite different from the typical image. The ape that everyone began to, the gorilla, everybody began to know, it's her favorite gorilla was a gorilla called Digit um, because, because of, they used to touch fingers initially. So Digit became kind of the symbol of the mountain gorilla and the symbol of this research. Uh, she also, you know, obviously she documented their behavior. Once DNA came out, it did turn out that gorillas are much less related to us than chimps. Chimps are about 99%. I think it's 96% with gorillas and orangutans, I believe are about 93%. So they're much further down the list. So with gorilla research, it's a little less about human origins after a while. Uh, it's still important, but but the human origin side really became more about uh, chimpanzees than it did orangutans and gorillas. The biggest thing uh, with uh, Fossey's research in Rwanda was that poaching was a huge problem, and the um, capturing and killing of gorillas for zoos, for museums, for for illicit trade, for bush meat was a massive, still a massive problem, although it's a worse problem at the time. And Jane Goodall very quick, excuse me, Diane Fossey, uh, became very anti-poaching. In fact, this is part of the debate about Jane, uh, God, I keep doing it, about Diane Fossey is, did she kind of lose herself in this? In 1977, she was already a figure, uh, her research was affecting poaching, just the fact that she was there. Uh, she would go after poachers, there's some debate how did she get violent with them? She did have a gun. There's some thought that maybe some poachers did disappear. But in 1977, New Year's Day, 1977, Digit was brutally murdered. Uh, and, it was, and it was not just collecting materials, although they did take the hands um, because they, they, they eventually, they, here you see the feet, but they did take the hands um, to, to sell. But basically this was left to, as a sign to Jane, uh, to Diane Fossey that, you know, we know who you are, and we're, you know, this was, this was a, and a, a, Fossey kind of lost it after, after this point. She continues to do research. She eventually wrote a book, uh, Gorillas in the Mist, and she wrote several scientific papers, of course, as well, but she never was as interested in the research after the death of Digit, and she spent most of the rest of her career working on anti-poaching activities. 1985, she was murdered. December 27th, 1985, she was murdered. And she's buried with some of the other gorillas that were killed by poachers. And a lot of people thought she really did kind of lose it by this point. Um, and, you know, that maybe to some degree her activities and, and, and the vehemence with which she went after poachers may have kind of made her a target. But uh, the book, Gorillas in the Mist, which was about her research, has been turned into a movie. I'm, I'm hoping this will be one of the movies I upload if you're interested. It's a great film. It's, you know, it's Hollywood, but it does a pretty decent job of showing 
I think, the passion of Diane Fossey. Diane Fossey really became, unfortunately, more famous after she died than before she died, because again, because of the tragic nature of both Digit and her own death, and the death of many other gorillas during her lifetime uh, because of poaching. Uh, the other one, the last one, is Baruti Gaudicus. Uh, she's the less known of these and the less popular of these. She's actually a little bit controversial. She's still around, she's still working, but she's a little more controversial. And ironically, she was the one that was the most well-trained. She's, um, again, also an American, uh, although her born in Germany, her parents are Lithuanian. They were escaping the Russians. They briefly were in Germany and then eventually migrated in 1948 to the United States. Um, she was in anthropology, went to UCLA, got her PhD, met Louis Leakey, convinced him uh, that she would be the great one for orangutan. Again, by the way, all three of these women kept hoping that their ape would be the, the key to human origins. Chumps seem to be that link, uh, gorillas and orangutans less so. So they're, they, they're all friends, but there was a lot of competition between them as well. But Dika's never quite connected with the public in the same way the other two did. Um, she was much younger and she was a little, uh, for lack of a better word, she was a bit of a hippie. And she doesn't, she, she again, kind of like Fossey, very shy. Um, when you watch the documentaries about her, it does seem a little more chaotic, even though she was the, the, the more trained scientist. Her research did seem a little more chaotic. She's, uh, she, she didn't really, you know, know how to use the media. Um, she was very much an activist right from the beginning. So it kind of repelled, I think, a lot of middle America. Uh, National Geographic never was quite as close with her as the other two women. Um, but like the other two, uh, she also became very much an advocate for the conservation of, uh, of apes, of orangutans. And again, you know, a lot of people say you're not supposed to be activists. I know, like, for instance, I try not to get into my politics in the classroom. Um, I try to separate myself from my research, but, you know, that's a real debate. And I have to be honest, if I was one of these women, I, I guarantee I would be just as active as they are about conservation. It, it's a tough balance to try to keep that objectivity, but also be, you know, a, a, a decent person. Um, she also kind of resented, I think, uh, Jane Goodall a little bit because in Indonesia, uh, again, these are very thick rainforests and orangutans spent almost their entire lives in trees. They barely come down to the ground. Um, they're probably the closest to the early apes before monkeys arrive. So in that regard, they're important because they, you do get a better sense of how early apes might have behaved before they began to come down from the trees and walk on two legs. You know, chimps might be a little more revealing to early humans. Orangutans would have been a little more revealing, I think, for early apes. Um, she also published quite a bit. She, she did have, you know, cover of National Geographic. She has several documentaries. Uh, but her work has never quite caught the public imagination in the same way the other three have. Now, um, but they're all three incredibly important and, and they have completely influenced how humans deal with nature and study animals and stuff. The last bit of, I wanna talk a tiny bit about is some research that was popular in the 70s, but has become less popular today. And that is being very interventionist with apes and actually trying to directly communicate with apes. The most famous of these was sort of the last of these women, um, Francine Pat Patterson, usually known as Penny Patterson, um, who was originally from Chicago and was trained as a psychologist, influenced by the research of, in particular, Fossey and Goodall, and wanted to, to kind of close that gap between humans and apes. And there's always been debate about language. Are, are we born hardwired to have a language, which is what Noam Chomsky has always argued for? Or like B.F. Skinner, is it totally behavioral? And of course, as, as always with most things, it's a little bit of both. But the thought was, can you train an ape to speak? Maybe not talk, because they'll never be able to talk the way we can. They don't have the lips and, and the voice box and all this and the hyoid bone. And, you know, they, they're just not, they're not evolved that way. But they have really good with their fingers. And if we teach them sign language, maybe they can communicate. So Patterson began to work with a one-year-old gorilla named Coco from a zoo. Um, so at one years old, she began to work with him and train him, you know, raise him like a kid and began to train Coco into language. And Coco eventually became a major celebrity. In fact, one of you asked me the other day about Coco. 
Uh, later, uh, Patterson is very good. At, was a, she's still around? She was very good at using the media and populating the subject. And it really caught the imagination of people. And these are some kids' books written by her about Coco. Um, you can see some videos. Uh, there's videos of Mr. Rogers with Coco. I remember watching it as a kid. Robin Williams with Coco. Apparently, when Robin Williams died, Coco signed that she's sad when she was told that Robin Williams had died. Um, but I want you to watch these. And is it language being spoken? Now, we know animals can communicate. I mean, I can say walk. Do you want to go for a walk, Iona? She's not in the room right now, but my dog, if she does it, boom, she's gone. My cat, if I say Staffa, right. And I can say, wah, wah, she won't come to me. But if I say Staffa, up, oh, she hears that. She'll come running. So they, we know animals can communicate a little bit. But do they know what they're doing? Do they understand the words? Can they, and then can they take the words and use them themselves? There's a lot of debate about that. I'm fascinated by Coco. I don't know though how, she clearly can sign. She clearly can say some stuff, but I want you to watch and, and, and maybe, you know, I am gonna have one or two quick questions for you to answer. And that's one of the questions I wanna have you answer is, and, and again, I, I'm not looking for a particular answer. Is she really communicating? Or is a lot of it Patterson? There's a real debate about this. Sadly, Coco did die in 2018. A lot of you may remember it. And, and she is still fascinating. Um, but that question, can animals talk to us? I don't know if they really can or not. There has been, by the way, there are a couple other quick studies done in the 70s with chimps. Uh, Roger Fouts very famously worked with Washoe. He also believed that, that using Skinner's ideas of behaviorism, that you could, if you raise them like a human, you could, you could turn them into speaking primates. Um, this is he and some of his workers working with Washu and other jumps as well. Uh, and this is uh, Nim, named for uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, Nim Chomsky, uh, with a guy named Herbert Terrace, also trying to do the same thing. Roger Fouts eventually had to stop his work because when chimps get a certain size, they, they're, they're too large to handle. Uh, they're as strong as, as three to four men, one chimp, and they're very dangerous. So they always have to stop at a certain point. And um, as Roger Fouts later discovered, what happens with the chimps is they can't go back in the wild, obviously, and they wind up in research, like AIDS research. There's a, a, a really, to me, heart-wrenching video uh, that I'm going to show. It's only two minutes of Roger Fouts being reunited with one of the chimps that he worked with 20 years later. And, and this chimp is dying in a cage and immediately recognizes him and signs his name, uh, which does show that they do use some language, even if we can debate how much they use. There's also another video I'm going, I'm going to have you watch. Again, it's about two minutes of another researcher coming to a chimp named Mama. Um, and, and Mama is literally dying. I mean, like, like within hours of this video, she died. And, and again, the reaction would be humans. And again, you can see some of Jane Goodall's work there where it's clear emotion. I mean, there's a smile, there's real emotion there. Um, Herbert Harris also came, like Roger Fouts, he also came to the conclusion that chimps, they might be able to sign a little bit, but they, they both end up agreeing that they can't, they don't really speak the way we do. But again, it's still debate, and I want you guys to be thinking about this. I think the biggest impact of this is not so much human origin research. I think the biggest stuff of that goes back to the 60s. I think most of, of, of the newer discoveries, it's really more about conservation and just apes for being apes uh, beyond the human connection there. And, and it is interesting how nowadays, just 50, 60 years later, uh, as humans, we love apes. We think they're great. We, you know, we, we no longer make movies about them being vicious. Even King Kong, we like King Kong in the movies now. He's not He's not the villain anymore. So I think it's probably been the biggest impact of, of their research. It's really changing in a post silent spring world, a post Earth Day world kind of changing attitudes about apes. All right, again, I think this will make a wonderful research project. I hope you guys, a couple of you might, especially those that are really into animals, this could be, this could be interesting. Maybe pick up that idea of the language. That could be a fascinating research paper or a capstone. Do apes really speak or not? And, and you know, look at the history, not the biology of it, but the history of that debate. All right, thank you guys. I'm, I know it's a little bit long, but, but no major documentaries this week. I'll see you later.